Hey guys, Claire here, and in today's video, we're going to talk about all things Harry and Meghan. Now, Prince Harry's Spare makes the Times Best Biography lists, much to the chagrin of the UK tabloids who have invested a lot of time trying to downplay the success of this book, so well done. Now, King Charles's shady estate dealings has officially made it to American media, and I love that for him. A scandal out of Great Britain. Apparently there's this law that's been on the books since medi medieval times in some areas of the country. If you die, you don't have a will, all your shit goes to this guy. Yeah, that's right. Wrong hand, this guy. It's backwards. The King of England gets your stuff. Your house, your books, those little soccer trophies. I'm sorry, football topsies or whatever you call them. And I know this sounds bad, but this is not a scandal. Great Britain is stealing from English people instead of Africans. I call that progress. Yeah. Yeah. Also this week, I saw posts on Twitter talking about Taylor Swift reportedly turning down the opportunity to play at King Charles's coronation. I don't know exactly how true that is, but... Mm. Now, there has been so much discourse surrounding Obit Scooby's book, Endgame. So have you guys got it? Do you like it? And if you haven't gotten it, why? Now, I have seen for the past week or two some very uh, passionate debates uh, from people who are pro getting the book and those who are not. Now, the British tabloids and the royalists online are basically doing to Endgame what they did to Spare, uh, trying to discredit the author. You know, they said Prince Harry was lying. Now they're saying Omid Scooby is lying. Um, remember, they had TK Maxx out here looking a damn fool saying that Harry was lying about something that was so easily disproven. Like, yeah, you guys have sales but they were so desperate that they did that and they're doing the same thing with Omid Scooby's book and just like with Spare they're trying to say that somehow Megan is the mastermind even though Megan has only written one book and it's a children's book <laughs> but I digress this book is essentially about the British royal family it's not a Harry and Megan centric book if you listen to the tabloids in the UK, that's what you would assume, but it's not true. And I do love the fact that the American media, I've seen multiple interviews um, that Omid has done with American media. And I've also seen like some segments that doesn't include Omid in it, but they're very clear that this is a Omid Scooby book about the British royal family that includes tidbits of Harry and Meghan because of course the way that Meghan has been treated and everything that has happened to present day is directly intertwined with a lot of the bad press that the British family has received. Their relationship with the tabloids, the leaking of stories, and their responses and lack of response to allegations and actions that they've done. It is the most famous family in the world. With no shortage of drama, the British royals have found themselves the subject of intrigue for millions. Now in his new book, ABC News royal contributor Omid Scoby is pulling back the curtain in Endgame inside the royal family and the monarchy's fight for survival. Omid, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here in the studio. Good to have you in person. So you write that this really could be uh, the family in crisis and potentially the Endgame. I mean, would there be at all a situation where the monarchy as we know it ceases to exist? Yeah, I'm glad you used that, that term as we know it because I think a lot of people think that I'm declaring the end of the royal institution. Listen, it's so deeply embedded into the foundations and every facet of British life that dismantling that would be a mammoth task. But I think we have reached this pinnacle moment where after the death of the Queen, more people are having conversations about the relevancy, the purpose of the royal family, but also, you know, the passing of the Queen, the late Queen, reminded us of how she skillfully upheld the values, the morals, the ethics and the principles that we expected from a firm, an institution at the head of our country that represents Britain on the world stage, those famous British family values. 
um, on display. And you know, I really wanted this book to question and look into whether the current working royals and all the events that we've seen in recent years also uphold those same principles, or are there things that need to change in order to solidify that positive future for the firm? You also detail years later the fallout that continues from that bombshell moment in Oprah's famous yeah. interview with Meghan Markle, where it's brought up that there was a, a member of the royal family who had concerns about the color of the baby's skin. What was the family's reaction to that? Yeah. You know, I think we spent so long talking about uh, that bombshell piece of information that Harry and Meghan brought up, but I wanted to go a little deeper than that. Firstly, I wanted to know why we haven't heard about it since. Harry and Meghan have done a Netflix series. Harry did a memoir, and we didn't hear those allegations brought up. I realised that these this was considered or classed as a private family matter. We sort of remember that recollections may vary statement from the palace. But ultimately, this is an establishment that should be uh, representative for every member of British society. And what was more worrying was to discover that there were two family members at the heart of that conversation. So it still remains unresolved. The Daily Mail, though, is reporting that in a Dutch version, it names King Charles as being at least one of those people who raise concerns about the skin color. I'm, I'm curious if you have any understanding of how that happened, yeah. this misnomer, and, and also the context of the conversation. Yeah, you know, this is an, this translation error that you refer to is an incident that happened just hours before being here in the studio, and as I'm aware that it's being dealt with by the Dutch publisher. You know, I wrote this book in English, I edited it in English, and it's been published by, in the US and UK, by HarperCollins, and, you know, for us, there were no names in the manuscript, Even if you so. knew, you would not be able to, and you do know, but you're not. I know, able, yeah. But you would not be able to publish it in the book, correct? The laws in the UK require to be, for one to be able to show and tell. I can tell, but I can't present those letters. They're not mine. So the power really lies in Harry and Meghan's hands. You've been accused of being a mouthpiece for the Sussexes. <laughs> How do you respond to that criticism? I think with me, it's always been this kind of like lazy way of delegitimizing what I have to say by just as assuming that this comes from the mouths of Harry and Meghan. I have never in my life sat with Meghan in a room and had an interview, a private conversation, exchanged notes. None of this stuff is true. Lastly, obviously, we're well aware of the rift between uh, the princes, Harry and, and William. Where does their relationship stand today? Yeah, you know, the release of Harry's memoir, Spare, was almost a year ago now, and I didn't want this book to kind of retread the stories that Harry had told us, but I did want to pick up where it left off. You know, he sat down on GMA and spoke about how he wanted uh, conversations with his family to recon reconcile after accountability and apologies have taken place. None of that has happened, particularly between himself and William. I know through sources he had someone, a mutual friend, reach out to his brother to see if they could facilitate some kind of conversation a few months after the release of his book. To this day, that still hasn't happened. Omid Scobie, always a pleasure to Thank talk you. with you. Want to let our viewers know Endgame Inside the Royal Family and the Monarchy's Fight for Survival is now available wherever books are sold. Personally, I had no intention of getting the book when I heard about it initially. I don't care about the British royal family. I talk about them because the Harry and Meghan story is deeply intertwined with them. But on a personal basis, girl, I don't care. I like Harry and Meghan, period, point blank. So all that I needed to know, I heard in the Oprah interview, I read in the book Spare, I saw in the Netflix documentary, and that's all I care to know. But if we're going to have this conversation on the channel, then I feel like it's important for me to actually do my due diligence and read the book. <laughs> there are far too many people on social media, people in general, who wax on poetically about things without actually consuming it and giving a bunch of hot takes out of context. And we don't want to do that, right? Two things have stood out to me. Omid, whether you like him or not, is the only royal reporter who has not completely and solely bent the knee to the royal establishment. The whole lot of these uh, royal reporters like the Piers Morgans, the Angela Evans, the Valentine Lowe's, the Camilla Tomney, they have completely kissed the ring of the different houses. Clarence House, Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace. Omid is the only one who hasn't. Omid is the only one who is 
critical lately because a lot of these people like Robert Jobson and whatnot, back in the day, you can always find, even Piers Morgan, them calling out certain things of the British family. But since Meghan came on the scene and they have their scapegoat, things changed. And all of a sudden, William and Kate are untouchable. So keep that in mind. So Omen is the only one who is willing to call a spade a spade. And secondly, a lot of the revelations that he has revealed in the book aren't really revelations. I think if you've been paying attention, we have all known this, have seen this. Harry and Meghan has talked about certain things. We've seen it carry out in real time, right? We know that Kate is a lazy mean girl. William is lazy and incandescent with rage. Charles is petty and will do anything to get good press. Camilla is scheming and will throw anybody and everybody under the bus to get good press to rehabilitate her homewrecking image. We know this. We've seen this. <laughs> it's, it's nothing new. And I can do an entire video where I don't say a word and we just do a slideshow of articles and book excerpts, excerpts and screenshots and videos of all these world reporters and UK tabloid writers saying the same things before. But for some reason, Omid says it in the book and it's blasphemy. It's a lie. The gaslighting is hilarious. So I'm loving the fact that the American media, it's very clear that this is just another book from another world reporter giving you insights into recent events for the British royal family. And this is not from Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan have already said what they needed to say. It's only the UK press that is focusing on trying to spin a narrative, which is what they do every single day, right? So since the American media is not buying into the nonsense, I would hope that Harry and Meghan continue to stay mute. Let them fight their own battles. Let them duke it out move on and enjoy their holiday season. Now, don't even get me started on the shock and horror and denials by the royal reporters in the UK tabloids when Omid Scobie talks about the massive amount of leaks coming from the palace, from Clarence House, and most especially from Kensington Palace, AKA William and Kate's camp. It is comical to me to see the reactions of these royal reporters on social media and on their silly little talk shows and panel discussions that they've done. Because for each one that I see, I can go back searching into like all of the Harry and Meghan related snippets that I have saved and provide receipts from the very same world reporter who is saying unabashedly that there are no leaks. The royal family does not leak. William and Kate does not leak. I can find receipts, videos, them saying it on social media, of them saying, yeah, you know, or, I, I met with this person, we had lunch and they told me this. Oh, you know, I'm stuck in traffic and we're heading to the palace, you know, so we can have our discussion so I could get the information that I can write in my silly little article. Like we have Robert Jobson talking about it coming from Kensington, but that's like a lot of reporters, many. And this was before um, Spare, who say the leaks were coming from the royal family and their staff, Dan Wooden. Robert Jobson. And we know Wooden is tight with Team Kensington Palace. Robert Jobson is tight with Team Charles and Camilla. They have said this. Even the tabloids have said this in court. They're like, um, yeah, we got the information from your family and their staff. But now the book is out. We don't know what they're talking about. We there's no leak. They're completely innocent. Oh, but Scooby is a liar. I swear, these people, <laughs> like, I can't even be mad. You just have to laugh because it's absolutely ridiculous. And they had to say, oh, no, we weren't talking about the Queen, the late Queen and Prince Philip. So we know there's only a very small pool of people. Uh, I know who it is. I'm not going to name it because let me tell you, Angela, this person 
is not racist. They totally took some very innocent comments out. Tessa, Tessa, there's a point in the book where he, he talks about the contents of letters between King Charles and Meghan Markle, in which two members of the royal household, I know who they supposedly are, right, these two people, let's call them royal household, that two of them had expressed these infamous concerns about the skin colour of uh, baby Archie before he was born, right? But my question is, obviously he's not got that from King Charles. No. So he can only have got it from Meghan Markle or her friends or people she's told this to, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's two things this book. One is blatant lies. Secondly, stuff he can only have got from Meghan Markle. So is it normal for, uh, and do you think it's true, that what some of the royal households have been leaking on the other royal households, like Meghan and Harry? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they can deny it all they like till they're blue in the face, but they, there's been an awful lot of leaking from, particularly from Kensington Palace, about how things were, uh, were developing. And, and obviously, it's so much easier for them to blame anything uncomfortable on racism, rather than actually address the fact that much of the negativity towards the couple is coming from within the royal family. The royal family and staff of the royal family are the ones that are very often leaking these stories to the press. The firm got alarmed that this couple were getting bigger than William and Kate and there was some briefing against them that got completely out of control and it went very badly for them. Harry and Meghan became such a popular couple, it put everybody's noses out of joint. The establishment wanted to retain the monarchy as it was, yep. to boost William and Kate and the media the Daily Mail and the Telegraph in particular, fed those lines. Well, drip, drip, I, I, drip, don't, drip, drip, I agree drip. with everything until you said the last bit. I think, I think that, that somebody in the palace decided to take them yes. down a peg or two and it went too far. Absolutely. But that's all history. Um, yes, the Express this morning is reporting, as other papers are, the, the latest trailer from the new section of uh, Harry and Meghan's uh, Netflix documentaries where he's uh, said that the, they, whoever they is, which is the palace of the media, uh, wouldn't tell the truth to protect us, but they would do to protect William. There is probably some truth in that, in the sense that the palace in particular was very keen to make sure that the heir to the throne yes. uh, was protected this... and Harry could be sacrificed if necessary. And actually when I was working, I, I shouldn't give the name of the paper, but I was doing a piece for one of the nationals, writing a piece. And I was told, because uh, I'm quite critical of the monarchy in many ways, I was told I could, I could say what I want about Harry and Meghan, but I had to lay off William and Kate. That was the instruction from the editor. So there, I think there was an element of truth in what he says. Although, you know, my job is to report on the royals and to be, you know, sometimes part of their PR spin and be positive about them. Um... I do know who made the comments about Archie's skin colour. The names were mentioned in letters between Meghan and Charles that were exchanged some time after the Oprah interview. We know from sources that Charles was horrified that that's how Meghan felt those conversations were and that he wanted to sort of as a representative of the family have that conversation with her. And it's why I personally think that they have been able to move forward with some kind of line of communication. And is it unfair to criticise Kate? Get your calls in for this now. Now note that this reporter <laughs> and I use that term loosely right here in this clip, on a weekly basis engages in conversations where Meghan and Harry, but Meghan specifically, is bashed, bashed and dehumanized regularly. And whenever callers call in and they're in support of Harry and Meghan, she will quickly cut the conversation away. But when the callers are very nasty about Harry and Meghan, she lets them continue to their heart's content. Double standards. There is a new royal book out, Endgame, by Omid Scobie. It's filled with shocking claims and quite a few of them are aimed at the Princess of Wales. Now, Scobie brands Kate as cold and a part-time working royal. That's over the number of engagements that she carries out compared to other members of the royal family. He also claims that Kate shivers whenever Meghan Markle's name is brought up and that she hasn't spoken to her since 2019 and that she advocates for mental health causes but reportedly ignored Meghan's cries for help. Now, some royal experts have said that the attack is unfair, but what do we think on the panel? Amy, is it unfair? No, 
fair. It's not unfair. It's absolutely fair game. We pay her wages. It's fine. A um, bit of constructive feedback every now and then. But I think the reason people have taken so much offence to this is because we like our royals, particularly our princesses, our Princess Kate to be like a Barbie we keep in the box in perfect condition. And she's beautiful. And she just sits there on the shelf looking gorgeous smiling, having the odd baby, looking mm. great in her outfits. But then when we take her out of the box and we start to actually look a bit beyond that and at her real humanity and what she might really be like as opposed to this completely polished, curated version, which is a great PR job by the royal, by the royals because she, she does have this flawless image. But, of course, it is curated. It's not a real person, is it? So once we scratch beneath the surface... What is the real case? But I don't find yeah. this that damning, do you? One of the reasons Catherine is so popular amongst certain demographics, and I'm going to say older people and yeah. men, is because she says absolutely nothing. nothing. Yeah. She's a good little girl who keeps quiet and doesn't tell, doesn't complain, mm. doesn't excuse, doesn't yeah. do anything, doesn't rock the boat, and is a very traditional, old-fashioned, mute woman. I've seen this over on Twitter, and I have to admit that Everybody is up in a tizzy over this one book that is about the royal family. But not one time did the royal family or anybody in the media give two shits about all these books wrote about Harry or Meghan. Anybody? Anybody. But because, because this book right here is giving you an insight of things that has happened since the Queen's passing and a little bit more prior to the Queen's passing when, yeah, um, everybody's wanting to voice their opinion and try to make it about Harry and Meghan when it's clearly about things that have happened in the royal family. And let me just remind everybody that Prince Harry and Meghan have been living in California for a while now. And there's a lot of things in this book here they would have had no clue about. But yet, yet, these commentators over in the UK are trying to say they definitely know that Meghan and Harry have a hand in this book. But yet, all these books here, not one time did the royal family or the UK media give two shits. Just saying. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think everybody over there in that royal household is shaking in their boots because obviously some books have gotten pulled uh in the never in the netherlands and uh i d you know everybody's saying that megan had a part in that come on guys let's be real here does everything have to be blamed on megan or is that just how you guys want to do it because that's just how you roll in life. Because at the end of the day, Omid Scobie wrote the stand book. Y'all can't see that. He's putting a bigger light on the royal firm, cult, institution, whatever you guys want to call it. Yet, the media still want to blame Meghan and Harry. Make it make sense, guys. Look at all these books. Unbelievable. And in this book is brutal, isn't it, Poppy, about Kate calling her cold and lazy? I mean, is Kate a little bit cold and lazy? I don't know. I'm Do not. Think... I don't want to come on this program and trash another woman, but um, she's not my fave royal. Okay. Who, who would be your favourite, Andrew? Well, or... it would be Meghan. Andrew? Meghan? Why what? would Andrew be I my favourite royal? I, I was just oh. Why trying... did your mind go to Andrew? He's the least favourite well, royal. Well, I have no idea. Royals. Okay, well, at least he's we can agree on the least favourite royal. But, okay, uh, have he's you met any favorite. of the royals? No, no uh, you said Meghan, though. I do, I do Meghan. like Meghan. Meghan, they had a chance to modernise the royal family. And, and they she really blew royally, it. They, well, no, the royal family blew it. No, she blew it. No, I mean, okay. I mean, James... Why, why do you think, why do you think she blew it? it? Why she may she have it? been blown 
away herself. That's the point Poppy's making. I, I understand yes. that point, but I think... What do you think about Kate? Um, so, Old. have you met any of the royals? Or... Unlike you, James, I've not had the... No, uh... so I haven't spent that much time with her, but I, <laughs> if anybody says, oh, she's cold, she's really not cold. I, I mean, she's... she's not cold. Why would she be cold with you? But, she's probably... But the, well, but the thing is, probably, the, the is saying that didn't write cold. that she was cold with you. She wrote that she was cold with Meghan, which absolutely could... Well, she's, well I, I'm not lazy. surprised. And lazy. And has been infantilised by the media. This is this is Kate described by Scobie, and has been given really rubbish jobs by the royals. Although I'm not the last one, I'm not sure about. Cause I'm not sure. I think she's got some very interesting roles. I, and I think also, um, the book is a desperate cry for money from Scobie. That's what it Isn't is. Isn't every book about the royals a desperate cry for money? Isn't uh, every there are many people that feel quite strongly about Harry and Meghan today, but I really challenge anyone to tell me what it is that Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, did wrong when she was a working member of the royal family, those years when she was just getting on with the job. And I think the royal family, even to this day, shying away from true conversations about its uh, uh, connections to the slave trade through the ancestors of the current living royals. Yeah. You know, these abstract terms that we hear King Charles talk about in uh, some of uh, most recently in Kenya, but also in Barbados a couple of years ago, aren't enough, you know, for the predominantly black and brown Commonwealth, for the m uh, mixed British landscape. Yeah. It, it, these words aren't enough. I think people want to see that this is a royal family that cares about people from every background and embraces them too, because right now the royal institution is looking very out of touch. How can a former pampered prince, who is now an aging king, keep the attention of those who already feel the monarchy is less necessary than ever, or worse, are totally indifferent to it? Ooh, girl, are you hearing this? Oh my god. That's right, bitches. We are going over the book that everybody's talking about just in the past 24 hours. I got an email about it. Next thing I know, I start seeing TikToks about it. Next thing I know, this morning, you got it talked about on the Today Show. Girl, I don't even know if it's been out 24 hours or not. I'm currently listening to the audiobook. Ugh. And the tea is so piping hot in my mouth that I can't keep it there. All right, I got to get it out. As soon as I'm listening, I'm like, oh my God, I got to tell them about this. I am thoroughly enjoying it, I have to say. So I'm not done with the audiobook. End Game by Omid Scobie. A look into the royal family and the monarchy's fight for survival. Ooh, ooh, is written by a British journalist, okay? Very close to the younger royals, William and Kate. Harry and Meghan, other younger royals, because he's of their similar age and because he wasn't a douche like a lot of the other journalists are, girl. People were going, we were told by the palace that Camilla would be referred to as queen consort, right? Remember all the talk, queen consort. You call her queen consort. Beep, 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 beep. And he says that that was the palace just telling a little fib um, to help the image of Camilla because as soon as that bitch got that crown on her head, bitch, she's queen now. There was like, she was called queen consort for a month. That's about it. <laughs> so girl, okay. Now, Omid has a lot of sources, people that used to be royal aides, people that used to be the royal this person, pe pe family, friends, sometimes even royal family members themselves, girl. He's got a lot of sources after over a decade of covering the royals. And he has, a, you know, I'm going to often say he's quoted from a source. He's quoted from a source saying after Queen Elizabeth had died that this is supposedly from Kensington Palace, from William's, you know, peoples, that Charles is the king, but William is the future. Ooh. And supposedly, girl, this is the sentiment that the royal family, well, really the, the palace, the institution, has had for many years and has been grooming William in this way. Like, your father, King Charles, is the bridge. Again, another quote from a source. Charles is the bridge. William is the future. Oh, so Charles is the bridge to get to the future to William. So this has like been the mindset of the palace for a really long time. Jesus, Jesus. He also goes into talking about how Charles and, and Camilla have been very jealous of William and Harry for a long time. 
which is a sentiment that has been proven correct uh, by Harry's memoir. But Omid says this is something that has been known in the journalists, in the media, and in close palace aides for a long time, before Harry came out and said anything. Everybody knew that Charles and Camilla would piggyback off of the negative press that their sons, his sons would get. They'd be like, oh, good. Well, let's like take this as an opportunity to make us look like the good ones. So he said that was a known thing among people in that circle. Harry didn't spill the beans to any of us, girl. We knew that already. Also, what was a known thing is the fact that uh, William didn't really want his brother Harry around much more. And, he, you know, he was kind of happy when Harry decided to split off to America with his American wife. William was like good riddance a little bit. Again, a source from Kensington Palace says the heir doesn't really need the spare anymore anyway. <laughs> Well, girl, here you go. Part two of the new royal tell-all end game. Sorry, the sun's in my face. Now, to continue with the prologue a bit before we move on, there's a couple important things. I ended the first part talking about how the source from Kensington Palace said the heir doesn't really need this spare anymore anyway, right? And Omid explains that it was well known that for a long time, William wanted to separate himself from Harry and Meghan. And not just because of personal issues, but William felt that the focus should be on him and Kate. They are the future, not Harry and Meghan. And so he would get annoyed that Harry and Meghan were taking up so much, you know, spotlight, news time, all that shit. And so not only just because of the rift he had with his brother and Meghan, but... For this reason, he was like, yay, go to America, please get the fuck lost because it's my time to shine soon. Does it sound familiar, girl? Does it sound like we're repeating behaviors that maybe our father did, you know? But Omid makes the argument that the Sussexes are extremely important to the future of the monarchy, even if they no longer have their official HRH titles and shit. Because whether you like them or not, whether you like Meghan or not, here you had the first person of color marry into the royal family and the whole situation went down in a dumpster fire of flames girl that is a huge stain on the future of the monarchy if you hear snoring it's my dog i'm just okay she's she's in a deep sleep right now and in the past what the royal family their motto is never explain never complain right some shit like that omid says that that motto cannot exist in the future that is an old sentiment from the old monarchy that died with the queen the queen could get away with ignoring problems and they would eventually fade away but he says king charles and even will and kate girl they can't ignore shit away anymore this is the day and age of accountability and the people are sure as shit wanting the accountability these days even if all that is, is an apology or an explanation or a discussion, and then you move on. But to just simply be like, we're not discussing it, mm, it's it's not going to work, girl. He then goes on to talk about how the rot, he calls it, has set in. And in the past, when the rot would come in, the queen was able to stop it from spreading because the palace has always had controversies, we all know. But the queen was able... You know, she was like the antibiotic girl that controlled it. But he said that is gone now that she's gone. And he fears that the rod is back and ain't none of them going to be able to stop it. Now, some people would wonder why would a trusted journalist that worked so closely with the royal family was even invited to private events, having cocktails with them, especially the younger ones, right? Why would he be telling all this shit now why did he write the book in 2020 about harry and Meghan? he co-authored he was even threatened uh, by the palace by other journalists and aides and told you know if you do this this was back in 2020 with that book if you do this girl they are gonna come for you they are gonna play dirty that's what they do you know too much you know a lot And they know that, and they ain't gonna like it. So why would Omid write that book, write this book? You know, basically, some would say ending his career with the royals by doing so. 
he sees it different. He says, I didn't end my career. I've moved on. He feels that the monarchy needs to have these difficult discussions for in order for it to thrive. And that by him bringing to light what he knows, girl, he didn't sign no NDAs or nothing like that. It will help this discussion and understanding of what is really going on here. Which of course he's making that money from the book too. Listen, I would do it. Girl, you don't even tell me you wouldn't do it. Omid also wants to remind everyone that the royals and the royal family and the institution will say and pretty much do anything to maintain itself. Do you understand? That's what it's all about, is continuing to maintain itself. How can we keep maintaining itself? Even when we, you know, we watch The Crown for all these seasons, that's what the theme is all, like how do we keep these people happy so we keep our position? That's what it's all about. But Omid feels that to continue to ignore the terrible truths of the monarchy will be at its own peril, especially now that the queen has passed. But now we can start the process of finding out if they ever got uttered, what the context was, and whether there was any racial intent at all. Like I say, I don't believe there was. The royals who are named in this book are King Charles and Catherine, Princess of Wales. Meghan's marrying into a family which has, to put it mildly, a dodgy track record on race. It's not Meghan Markle's problem, it's their problem. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, hit that notification bell.